Bob, what's your take so far on, on the things we've covered on the webinar? Uh, well, I can tell you that we've experienced all those things where we've had manufacturers that sell our brands that we sell through our website directly to Amazon uh, as an Amazon direct seller. We've had our manufacturers sell directly from their websites. So all this stuff is is ringing true for our experience. And, um, you know, wouldn't mind putting my two cents in on some of that stuff. Well, let's get to those two cents here. Uh, before we do, what we've done the polls a little bit differently here. We actually asked our guests, we asked Bob, Bob, what are you curious about knowing from the audience? And so we want to know, what is the size of your company? Bob's very curious, particularly about the size of employees that you have and uh, obviously runs the gamut. So with our webinar audience here, tell us how big the company you have in terms of employees there. All right. Give it a couple more seconds before we close the polls. Okay, let's close that and show the results. Wow. So Bob, what do you think on looking at those? Well, the, the, the folks the folks that have one to five, they are the brave people. They also are the people that have the least number of options in terms of uh, delegating things out, uh, they're going to be doing the most of everything. So I admire those folks. Uh, and I, I really wanted to get a feel for that. Like how, how flexible are we in being able to delegate certain things that we do day to day in our web business and how inflexible are we where we absolutely can't do that. But me as the owner, me as the designer, I, I still have to do all these uh, detail things because I just don't have a lot of folks to delegate to. I wanted to get a good feel for that. Very good. Well, let's talk about how your company began. These are old Tommy shots of Soberweld's history. Talk to us real quick about where Soberweld has come from up to where you're at now. Well, the uh, the company was originally founded in uh, 1938 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, during the midst of the Depression, we had lost our largest uh, customer, Union Carbide, which is now Praxair. And uh, so we were, we were a cylinder hauling company, and we were forced into the welding supply business. So we've been a welding supplier since 1938. We sell industrial gases locally, argon, CO2, oxygen, things like that, and also welding equipment. And that's in 2000. Uh, we went online as a welding equipment and safety equipment seller. So we've been in business since 1938. We've been online since 2000. Uh, and I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the fourth generation. My son, Jim, who works for me, is fifth generation family business. Awesome. That's really awesome. Well, and, and Bob, you know, we talked to a lot of clients that feel, uh, I guess you could say, bashful about putting their history um, on the website because they have natural privacy concerns and things like that. But how important do you think it is to tell your story? Is that is that a big thing? Is it depending on the store? I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Well, both you and Don made the point that you got to be personal and you have to be human, um, and I support that 100%. Um, our original business model for CyberWeld is that we were going to give you a more personal online buying experience than your in-person experience talking to an orange smock at Home Depot buying a piece of welding equipment or going into your local air gas distributor where if you're not buying 12 cylinders of oxygen that guy behind the counter just wants you out of the store. Right, exactly. And you have to really paint a, a very big difference between you and that guy in the store, right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Bob, I know one of the things, we're going to do an, another quick poll, and another thing that you were curious about uh, is, is the products that they sell. Um, do, do these merchants feel like they're selling a commodity? And while they're voting here, you want to speak to that, Bob, and just kind of give some feedback on, on why you're curious about that? Well, obviously, if you're if you're in a niche market, it's much easier for you to be an expert on your product and the stuff that you're selling, and so it's much easier for you to differentiate yourself against your competition. If you're selling a commodity, obviously, um, there's a struggle there. Um, how do I differentiate? Um, certainly, web design, uh, trustworthiness, the personal touch. I love the fact that you guys pointed out 
you got to have your telephone number all over the place. You have to have as many touch points with human beings as an option as possible. And I just, I just wanted to see, yeah. So about 48% are dealing kind of with commodity issues. I will say this, particularly with those that are competing against Amazon with commodities. Um, one of the things that we did with products that we simply could not compete toe-to-toe -to -toe with Amazon on, brands that we sell and that Amazon sells direct and buys from the same manufacturer, their pricing philosophies are different across different products in the same brand line. And so what we did was we deliberately picked out accessories and replacement parts that, hey, Amazon had, but they didn't display them well. They didn't necessarily care to be competitively priced on them, and they really didn't describe them well. So even on a commodity um, item, particularly when you're selling against Amazon, hey, find out which ones are they sort of ignoring, and then you optimize that part, and you go after that. And in that way, you, um, you piggyback off of what Amazon is doing because we've got hundreds of customers that never bought a piece of equipment from us, they bought it from Amazon, but they come to us to buy the replacement parts, the accessories, and the nuisance stuff that Amazon just rather would not deal with very well. That's great feedback. Don, what, what are you hearing on that? What's, what's your take on what Bob's sharing? We put Sorry there, Eric. I, I, no, I had muted myself. <laughs> So I wouldn't make too much noise. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I think you've got to really watch it, especially to me, the toughest is when you are selling a commodity. Um, but, you know, you can find a way to stand out and you can find a way to, you know, really provide an expertise in that commodity even as much as possible. It obviously depends on what you're selling. Um, but the more you can, you know, make yourself a community uh, around what you're selling, the better off you're going to be because you can make it stand out. And, and make people feel connected to you. So Definitely. Thank you, Don. And uh, Bob, I want to go and talk about your brand. We're talking about the big brand battle today. So I want to ask you some branding questions related to your design. And one of the things you can tell um, right there how some of your brands are listed, you not only have to build up the Cyberwell brand, but you have to flatter a lot of key brands that matter to your customers. I know B Miller is one of your big brands. So how would you advise merchants that also feature key brands on their side? They've got to build up their brand, but they also have to flatter very specific brands that matter to their customers. How does that play into the strategy? I mean, what, what are your thoughts overall? Well, from the very beginning, we deliberately limited uh, the brands that we put on our store. Um, mm -hmm. I can probably have another dozen brands on my site, but we mm -hmm. decided to be hyper-focused. So Number one, I would say take your top two or three brands and really go deep with them. Uh, a lot of our competition and a lot of the competition that the attendees face are a mile wide and an inch deep. You want to go really narrow and you want to go really deep and that is how you become an expert in your brand and that's how people begin to trust you because you're not only selling the big ticket stuff, the obvious stuff, but you're selling an O-ring that costs 45 cents, and that guy says, man, if that guy is taking the time to put a 45-cent O-ring for this $3,000 piece of welding equipment on his site, he knows about that $3,000 piece of equipment. Yeah, definitely. And so, Bob, I think a lot of people are probably looking at this going, what's the deal with the mouse? Now, this is Arky the mouse, which kind of purposely – flies in the face of what you might expect on a welding website, am I right? What's, what's your take on Arky? Exactly right. So back in 2000 when uh, Cyberwell was coming online, uh, most industrial sites, it's like diamond plate, it's flames flying all over the place, it's sparks, <laughs> it's like, you know, this is a tough guy site and uh, we're going to kick your ass if you don't buy something from us. <laughs> right. And, uh, I mean, to your point, CyberWeld is an industrial product, but we want it to be friendly. We want you to feel comfortable. You, we want you to feel like this guy is your friend and he wants to help you learn about welding if you're not a welding expert. So, uh, actually, my kids were the ones who picked 
the mouse design. So I, I got to give kudos to my three kids. Here we go. Give them a, give them a little profit sharing or something with that. But uh, Bob, you know, one of the things here, you know, we talked about earlier is really emphasizing what you do well. And we introduced you by talking about your standards of customer service. Uh, you do a lot of things really well. Is your focus to really dive deeper on those things right now, or is it to expand into new initiatives beyond what you're currently doing, or is it both? Well, what's your focus right now? Well, it's it always starts and ends with people, um, and we encourage our customers to have contact with us. Um, so. Yeah, as soon as you start losing that, and I know you referred to us as a Goliath, but when you think about us, we are a single location welding distributorship right. in right. central New Jersey, but we are the largest independent distributor because of what we do online, and um, Airgas has 800 distributor locations around the country. We have one. And yet we have a larger brand name online than they do because of our people, because we value the, the, the human aspect. Um, so that's number one. We never want to abandon that. So always stay hyper-focused on that, no matter how big or small you are, because um, Goliath loses sight of that. That's the first yeah. thing Goliath loses sight of. The second thing is our other initiatives are, hey, we got to compete with Amazon. Therefore, we have to provide similar customer service in, as far as shipping and logistics. So we've strategically located distribution centers around the country to help um, give our customers a fulfill our customers' shipping expectations that they've gotten from Amazon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I appreciate. I like how you said that. I appreciate how you phrased that with. Um, you know, the David versus Goliath analogy, and that, of course, that's just bigger speech, but how, how do you see your, your brand? I mean, do you see yourself essentially still, even with all your success, as the underdog? You're facing, uh, you know, a lot of other competition, or do you see it more from a standpoint of, look, we've, we've achieved the success. It's more about fending off folks that want to topple us from the mountain. Is that even a fair question? What do you think, Bob? Oh yeah. Hey, look, we we are still David. We're still small. I have, I have I have 26 employees, and yet we are the largest branded welding supply site in North America. And so it's, hey, we got to stay quick and nimble, because that's what Goliath doesn't do. You know, he just stood right, there right. and the rock hit him in the head. Right. Um, so we so we got to keep moving. But at the same time, yes, we are the top brand. People are copying us. People are bidding on our on our keyword terms, and so from that standpoint, um, you know when when the Goths and the Vandals overthrew Rome, it was because they were hungry and the Romans were complacent. We can never be Rome. We got to be the Goths and the Vandals, no matter how big we get. Great point. Well, let's go directly into talking about your competition, and you know here we've got. I think one of the last remaining items that you have on Amazon, we'll talk here in a second why that's the case and why that's soon to disappear, but um, before we go specifically into Amazon, let me just talk in general about the competition. Um, now I, I've known you for several years and uh, you've always struck me as the guy that keeps an eye on the competition, but it's not an obsession, it's not a, a focus, you know, you're, you're much more focused on what you're doing. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If 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 we do what we do best, we don't need to be constantly looking over our shoulders at our competition. We can't get complacent, and we got to keep an eye and be aware where they're at. But we don't have to keep looking over our shoulders uh, instead of leaning towards the finish line. Right. Well, Bob, what would you say to the uh, merchant that's maybe hearing that and saying, "Well, Bob, that's easy for you to say, but..." My competition is kicking my butt. I mean, how can I not copy what they're doing? They've experienced success. I want some of that success. Um, you know, I have to look at my competition because they're creaming me. You know, what, what would you say to that merchant? Well, I would say, well, why are they creaming you? If you are the expert in your product, if you bleed your product, how are they creaming you? You know, for us, um, it's about content. I write all the content on the site. 
Uh, and I heard this rule of thumb before, and I, I totally endorse it. If you're not spending at least a half an hour, 30 minutes, and I don't care if you're selling a pay-per-click, mm -hmm. if you're not spending at least 30 minutes in developing the copy for that item, you're selling yourself short. You've got to be the expert, and the first thing that you do is you do that through content. So you got to be the expert in content. You got to be the expert in images. Make sure you got good images, and then you got to make sure that you've got um, really good professional people working on your paid traffic. Even in even in this world of you know Google AdWords and display ads and Bing, where we seemingly have to pay for every single qualified lead, CyberWeld still has 50% of its sales through organic search and that comes through unique, excellent, expert content. Right. Exclusive Concepts handles your PPC and SEO, correct? Absolutely. And like right. most of you guys, especially those that are smaller, I handled our um, uh, PPC and SEO by myself for nine years mm -hmm. and when I finally gave it to somebody else my revenue through paid search doubled and my expense for paid search was cut in half and that was wow. accomplished within six months that's awesome wow. yep absolutely well, let's, let's go directly into Amazon here I mean Bob we are in an omni-channel world right now um, you know what? What are your thoughts on Amazon, or really any other shopping channel, in regards to selling on them versus just building up your site? I mean, you're kind of getting out of dodge here with Amazon, right? Yeah. So we've been on multiple marketplaces over the years. Right now, the only multi-channel platform I'm on right now is Amazon. We do that through the um, through the paid ad kind of thing, the pay-per-click um, display ads that show up at the bottom. Amazon is doing away with those, so that's going to go away. We uh, so the strategy going forward is going to be, hey, look, you do need some sort of an Amazon presence for us, and the margins that we sell at online in our regular online store, it's very difficult to sell any product through Amazon and make any money once they add their, um, you know, their commission on it, and that's just the nature of our product and our industry. And so going forward. We will use Amazon as a break-even advertising platform, and what I mean by that is the, the, we're, we're going to have a sample uh, of products that we're going to offer at, through Amazon as an Amazon seller, um, where we know we're not going to make any money, but we're going to use those items to bring traffic back to our site and then hopefully build ongoing future loyal direct buy folks uh, you know from the Amazon population right now Amazon drives about five percent of our traffic through those Amazon pay-per-click ads I'm not willing to give that up when that goes away so we will be offering some products directly through Amazon but knowing we're not going to make any money on it we're just buying qualified traffic right and I think we have another uh, poll our final poll today and uh, the question is regarding where you sell your products. If you're exclusively online, if you sell on a brick and mortar, where do you sell your products? And Bob, this is also something you're very curious about finding out about the audience, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've been a brick and mortar for 77 years, and so we, I come from that world. And um, I just wanted to see how many were just online only. Um, just out of curiosity because the online only person has a unique perspective and unique challenges that um, yeah so the maj the majority are online only that's that's really interesting how does that compare with previous webinars that you've done have you asked this question before we have a while back and you know to me that's still a pretty significant chunk of brick and mortar that's yeah. actually higher than I would have thought I was surprised. I thought that the online only would just be a runaway smash, but that's a pre that's a pretty big chunk. Um, still a minority, obviously. A pretty big chunk of, of folks are still on brick and mortar, Bob. Well, I want to say to the brick and mortar folks, one of the reasons that we've succeeded is because in our industry, um, 
welding suppliers use the internet as a source of incremental sales. And we decided that we were going to be an internet company first. And so we've been in business forever as a bricks and mortar store. And yet today, 87% of our revenue comes through the internet because it is my single number one priority focus. Mm -hmm. And you have to focus, right, Bob? You mean you've got to put most of your focus into something. Well, that's right. If you're going to be the best and it's the owner that drives the company culture and 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 the company right. passion if you're right. going to be the best you can't be you can only be focused on micro focus laser focused on one thing so you got to pick that thing if you're going to be a bricks and mortar store with the internet as an incremental sales platform great you're going to limit your success going forward online but maybe that's your strategy but if you want to be hey the internet is where it's at this is where we're going then you got to be hyper focused, right? So. Well, really quick, I want to get into the shipping here that we've got the slide up on, but I have to ask this question because I think a lot of merchants are are wondering this. We get a lot of these questions here at EY. Um, Bob, there's a lot of merchants who are making a lot of money on Amazon, and it and it dwarfs what they're currently doing on their site. And so, how would you address the merchants? Say, Bob, that that's great. You know, I'd love to focus on my site, but considering how much money I'm making on Amazon, it's hard for me to focus on my site. What, what do you think? Um, we've always been just the opposite. Um, as a direct site, so cyberweld.com, I've got lower um, overhead than Amazon. I've got better customer service than Amazon. Um, I can move faster than Amazon. And so I can offer my product through my direct site more competitively priced than I can through Amazon or more competitively priced than my competitors that are selling through Amazon as well. So um, our focus has always been on our site first because we can be more competitive there. We can provide better customer service there. And I also am not handcuffed by Amazon's return policies, which um, particularly for our product, very heavy product, very expensive product, it can put us out of business overnight. Right. Right. Well, let's talk about shipping real quick. I mean, this you, you have the West Coast distribution that you started in Arizona. It was at least partly born out of response to Amazon Prime, right? Yeah, absolutely correct. So we had we had a four or sometimes five standard ground uh, shipping days from the East Coast where we're at New Jersey to the West Coast. California is our number one sales state. Um, Amazon Prime, you know, I'm an Amazon Prime member. My wife buys from Amazon, I bet you, three or four times a week. And it's like, hey, um, I want to give that shipping expectation to our customers. How are we going to do it? Well, we got to go standard ground closer to, our, uh, to where our customers are. So by opening up a place in Arizona, we're able to reach now 82% of all of our customers around the country within two that's a population standpoint from uh, uh, two standard ground shipping days. And that's one of the reasons we did that. I also want to stress, for those of you who are freaking out and saying, yeah, I'm, I don't have the money to go open up a warehouse somewhere, um, neither did we. Um, we leased things. We didn't buy stuff. And so we started small and then expanded. We started very small in Arizona. Uh, we doubled the facility recently because... We had success, but we started out very cautiously and very conservatively, and you can do that. Great advice. And Bob, um, just in closing here, we've got the, the final slide. There's me and Bob there in New York recently. And Bob, uh, after looking at Don in his uh, Santa outfit, you're going to spot me in the gym, right? Next time we take a picture together, we're going to look a little different, right? No, I'm just going to say uh, Don is going to be like a shapeless blob for his grandchildren about <laughs> 10 or 15 years from now because he's not going to keep it up in the gym. <laughs> okay, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, <laughs> well, Bob, this, this is 60 seconds in closing here, and we're going to go to site reviews after this. Just 60 seconds. What's your overall advice to folks that are – looking to take their brand to the next level, they're, they're besieged by competition, there's all kinds of challenges in today's e-commerce landscape. What's your 60-second advice to folks out there? 
a cyber world completely turned around in 2000 in 2009 for uh, three things number one I gave up pay-per-click um, and I gave it to somebody else I gave it to a good professional number two the site had a significant facelift for the first time in nine years um, and number three I got hyper-focused because I wasn't involved in the pay-per-click anymore I got hyper-focused on content so I'd say get out from under pay-per-click give it to somebody who knows what they're doing better than you um, let somebody take a look at your site and get it up to standard snuff and then number three you're the expert be the expert and write about it